The work undertaken by the Vith Furul team is done with respect for and an understanding of the value of the myths, legends and lore of cultures and societies across the world. Although the sagas and tales we discuss have their origin in Norse Icelandic culture, they belong to all of humanity. We do not tolerate racism, prejudice or discrimination. We believe in fairness and equality for all and stand against any kind of misappropriation of the material covered in this podcast by white nationalists or supremacists. Vidvorul, the women pioneers in the Vinland sagas, a special series of the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. With these special episodes, Dr. Johanna Katrin Friedrichsdotter and myself will guide you through a fascinating analysis of the Viking Age of women who sailed the whale road to distant shores, living in the twilight of one belief and the dawn of another, who claim land, thriving against all odds and driven to seek out their own futures. They are Vidvuru, the women pioneers in the Vinland sagas. The Saga of Eric the Red Chapters 2 to 6 Gudrid and Thorbjörg The Vinland sagas are two separate works. Eric the Red Saga, and the Saga of the Greenlanders, which belong to a literary genre known as the Saga of the Icelanders, or Islendinga Sogur. The identities of the authors of the Vinland Sagas are unknown. However, Eric the Red Saga can be found in two manuscripts, Hauksbok, written in the 14th century, and the 15th century Skalholtsbok. It is thought these works were based on the original version of Eric Saga Rauta, written some time in the early 13th century, but it is impossible to pinpoint the date or place of composition with much precision. The Saga of the Greenlanders is preserved in the Fleti Jarbok, a late 14th century manuscript, with the original thought to have been written some time in the early 13th century. The Saga of the Icelanders, often regarded as some of the finest literature of the Middle Ages, are also called family sagas, which take place during the Saga Age, a time that spans a hundred spheres, beginning with the settlement of Iceland around 870 AD and tapering off in the 11th century. The sagas are prose narratives recorded in the 13th and 14th centuries and give us an intriguing insight into many aspects of Viking Age life. Though many of the narratives contain what we might consider to be imaginative and engaging storylines, as a historical source, they still remain truly valuable. The Vinland sagas are important for a variety of reasons. With these episodes, we are embarking on a voyage of discovery of women that we have described as Vidvaru or far-travelled. But where was Vinland, and why is that so important? Quite simply, the Vinland sagas contain the first descriptions of the Norse discovery and colonisation of North America. In fact, these accounts reveal far more to us than only the daring exploits of Viking Age men and women. They are also family sagas, and as such, there are themes we might expect to find. Lineage, conflict between old and new traditions and religions, marriage, poverty and wealth, and survival. The sagas have intrigued us for centuries. Amidst narratives of Viking exploits and pioneer life in a new land, and elaborate feuds where grievances are held and scores are settled over decades. The crisp, understated style and convincing depictions of universal human emotions never fail to engage new generations of readers. 
Today, we will discuss Guðriður Þorbjarnardóttir, a woman whose ancestor was among the followers of Auð the Deep-Minded. Guðriður grew up with her family on the farm Laugarbrekka, at the very tip of the Snæfellsnes Peninsula in West Iceland, under the Snæfellsjökull glacier, a snow-capped mountain with a mysterious aura. Many sagas are set on this peninsula, and if they are anything to go by, the first century or two after the settlement of Iceland were exceptionally eventful here. This is the setting of bitter feuds, love triangles and unhappy marriages, sorcery and strange supernatural happenings, such as the Froða wonders, where it rains blood and apparitions haunt the living. As we discover in Barða saga Snæfellsás, or the saga of Barð, the Snowfell God, the mountains of Snæfellsnes are inhabited by trolls. But the machinations of Snorri the chieftain, a calculated, ruthless politician, whose climb to power is related in Irvika saga, show the peninsula in a less mythical light. The website Saga Map pins all of the different locations in the sagas, so you can trace all of the action on the map should you want to trace our character's footsteps. In the last episode, we covered chapter 1 of Eiríksaga, the story of Auð the Deep-Minded and her journey from Caithness to Kvammur, which faces Snæfellsnes from across the fjord Breiðafjörður. The saga subsequently moves away from Auð and her family, but the chapter serves the purpose of explaining the background of Guðríður, the saga's central character, and how her grandfather Vivit came to Iceland. It also establishes literary themes that permeate the rest of the saga. Travel and colonization are a way of life for these people. Violence is always present. Two religions coexist. Social hierarchies are strongly based on the prestige of one's lineage and women are individuals with agency. The next chapter of the saga focuses on Eric the Red Thorvaldsson, a Norwegian who settled in Iceland, but who eventually moved to Greenland. The saga relates that Eric and his father left Norway for Iceland because of killings, and although it doesn't go into more detail, the first piece of information we receive about Eric is indicative of his character. In Iceland, Eric soon becomes embroiled in skirmishes with his neighbours, and he is involved in yet more killings. Given his violent track record, it was no coincidence that he was ousted from society a second time. We can also note that his daughter Freitis might have inherited some of Eric's features, but more on that in the next episode. A convicted murderer, Eric now goes into hiding, and soon after he sets sail and leaves Iceland in secret to avoid the revenge of his victim's relatives. He heads west to Greenland, where he spends three years exploring the land. After this time, he returns to Iceland to recruit people to come and settle with him, calling the place Greenland for, quote, Men would be the more readily persuaded there if the land had a good name. According to the saga, this is the beginning of the Norse colony in Greenland, which began approximately in the year 985, if this account of events is to be believed. After the interlude about Eric the Red, the saga returns to Snæfellsnes, and the real heroine of Eirik Saga is introduced. Guðri was the name of Thorbjörn's daughter. She was the most beautiful of women, and in every respect an excellent woman. Guðri is said to be a skörungur in Old Norse, a word that literally means a poker for a fire, but it is often used in a positive sense about women that stand out for their assertive personality and this will become manifest later in the saga. But how old is she at this point? In sagas and poetry, 
girls are often introduced when they are around the age when it's time to get married, which seems to have been at between 14 and up to the late teens. In this context, it's not surprising that the saga soon turns to the question of Gudri's marriage, relating a story about how a successful local sailor and tradesman named Einar asks her father Thorbjörn for her hand in marriage. Einar is said to be handsome, well-mannered and well-dressed, perhaps overly so. He's described as a skartsmaður, a man of finery, which means someone who flaunts their wealth ostentatiously by wearing fancy clothes and jewellery. Before proposing, Einar secures the support of Thorbjörn's friend and neighbour, Ormur. Ormur and his wife Hatlis lived at Arnastapi, which is just a stone's throw away from Gudrir's family farm, Laugabrekka. And they fostered Gudrir in her youth. Fostering relationships were a common way for Norse families to create bonds of mutual loyalty and support, and they were heavily regulated by law and custom. In the absence of much in the way of official institutions in Norse society, Marriage was another way to form ties. The way marriage was organised made it primarily a business transaction between men and sometimes women. The bride's body and reproductive capabilities, along with any dowry she received, was exchanged for capital possessed by the suitor's family, such as material assets, political clout or higher social status. Each new match created a set of important reciprocal duties between groups, so getting married wasn't a private matter between two people. It concerned their extended families, parents, grandparents, siblings, and any children they might already have. Norse laws afforded women more rights than many other ancient and medieval cultures, such as the right to inherit a known property, and to decide where they lived, but they had no formal say over who should be their life partner. Marriage was an institution of such importance that the adults in charge weren't about to leave any decisions in this regard to young people. In both sagas and laws, suitors wishing to marry approach the woman's legal guardian, often accompanied by their own fathers or uncles, or in this case, a friend of the family. If he, for it was usually a man, agrees to the match, the two of them settle on the amount of property each party brings into the marriage, along with other formalities such as the date of the wedding and the couple's home. This is usually all done without the woman's knowledge and she only finds out that she is to be married after an agreement has been reached. She had no right to refuse the marriage by law unless she was a widow. But here, Gudrider is only a young girl who has likely just reached marriageable age. However, the plan goes awry and Einar doesn't get the girl. Ormur brings up the proposal on Einar's behalf, but makes the strategic mistake to mention money, or more specifically, Thorbjörn's lack of it. And what a good thing it would be for him to get a rich son-in-law. Stung by this, the father vehemently rejects the suit although he had a golden opportunity to marry his daughter to a successful man who was able to provide her with security and perhaps help the family. Thorbjörn professes to be enraged at the thought of marrying Gudri to the son of a slave, and he lambasts his friend Ormur for entertaining the idea of such a low match for her. Ironically, Einar's and Thorbjörn's fathers had both been freed from slavery which arguably meant that they were social equals, but this is complicated by other factors, namely lineage, social status, and emotions. Einar's father is said to be very rich, but no further information is given about him. Whereas earlier in the saga, Thorbjörn's father, the enslaved Vivit, is said to have been high-born, and he had been in the entourage of Öd the Deep-Minded, who gave him freedom and land. His son, Thorbjörn, is described as a hot-headed, 
ambitious man. Thorbjörn is upwardly mobile, joining the class of free farmers and even achieving the major accomplishment of becoming a chieftain. Viking Age Iceland had no king, so this was the highest level one could reach, and it's usually considered more respectable than trade in the sagas, even if the latter was likely more lucrative. However, as mentioned previously, in this chapter we discover that Thorbjörn has a cash flow problem, and it eventually emerges that he needs to sell his farm. So when Einar's proposal is brought up, he's on the brink of a major scandal and the thought of losing face to his friends and family by having his daughter marry someone who is, in his view, a showy upstart. This is unthinkable. Thorbjörn cannot bear the idea of forming ties with a man he considers beneath him socially, and he lets his snobbery, jealousy and shame about his impending loss of status get the better of him. Soon after the proposal, Thorbjörn holds a big feast, perhaps a surprising decision given his depleted finances. He can't delay the inevitable any longer, and he announces that the family will now move to Greenland. This shocks everyone, but he explains his financial situation, and they see that he has few alternatives but to sell his farm, emigrate and start anew. His friends, Ormur and Haltis, are allegedly so bereft at the thought of parting from their friends that they too decide to move there, and they all set off. The journey to Greenland is an ordeal. First, they get caught in a storm, and they're cast about for weeks in the sea, and this is followed by an outbreak of disease. Many people on board the ship die, including Ormur and Haltis, and the survivors arrive in the Norse colony after weeks of hardship. There they are taken in by a man called Thorkell. Guðríður and her family are now impoverished castaways in a strange country. The following winter is unusually harsh, bringing famine and privation, and things are looking bleak. But let's not forget that Guðríður is a skörungur. All will be well. Famine. In those days befell such hard times in Iceland that not like them had been known there. Well nigh all gettings from the sea and all drifts came to an end, and this went on for many seasons. Early on in the saga of the outlaw Grettir, we are told of a period of difficulty that lasted for many seasons, and it was a time of hardship felt by the whole community. Indeed, Things were so grim that a fight breaks out between men who have come to claim the body of a dead whale that is washed ashore after a storm. The importance of the carcass is due to the amount of meat and blubber that might be salvaged and preserved. The design of Viking ships appears to have been a disadvantage when hunting whales at sea, and so settlers began to depend on these creatures coming ashore as driftage. The fight between Thorgil's Maxon, a kinsman of Grettir's father Asmund, and the troublesome foster brothers Thordgear and Thormund escalates into bloodshed and death. In Eric Sagarautha, we are presented with another example of a beached whale as a welcomed answer to starvation, though it has an altogether different outcome. The expedition to Vinland of Gudrid and her husband Thorfinn Karsefni runs into trouble when, being preoccupied with exploration, the group fails to ensure they have enough provisions to last the winter, which turns out to be very harsh indeed. The body of a whale, the likes of which they have not seen before, lands on the Stromsfjord coastline. The group butcher the carcass and cook the meat, but quickly fall ill after consuming it. We will return to this interesting event in a later episode of the series. The colonisation of uninhabited or uncultivated lands presents many obstacles for the would-be settler. A very real danger was the failure of crops, dwindling food supplies and famine. Such a scenario could be utterly devastating to a community on an outpost as far removed from its mother country as Iceland was. At one point, before Greenland was settled by Eric the Red, Iceland would have been the most remote colony 
on a map of the Viking world. When Iceland was settled by the colonists, their arrival disturbed what was a delicate ecosystem. In the last episode, we discussed the landscape, rich fertile inland dales, foresty lowlands, and impressive mountain peaks. The gradual exploitation of Iceland's natural resources began to take its toll. Deforestation and overgrazing meant the land had little time to recover or prepare for the seasons ahead. Quite simply, Iceland differed from the colonies in Scotland and Ireland, where the ecosystem was far less fragile and recovered well from agriculture, allowing a community to grow and expand. Let us consider a possible chain of events that Jesse Biowick explains exceptionally well in his book The Viking Age in Iceland. The introduction of livestock reduced the yield of the grasslands when the animals fed on the grass at the wrong time of year. Thus, it had far too little time to recover from the previous season. If there had been a harsh winter, this effect was intensified. But a series of cold and wet summers could be equally problematic. The proximity of Iceland to the Arctic Circle also means that weather can frequently change abruptly. Though the climate of Iceland and Greenland was somewhat milder during the time of settlement, summers could also be brief, and winters particularly unforgiving in the Viking era. The arrival of drift ice along the coast would lower the temperature again. So, a summer too cold and wet to harvest and prepare hay results in less feed for livestock. A farmer who was left with few options other than to drastically cull the size of his herd might feed his family in Kenwell that winter. However, a pattern such as this can only lead to disaster and eventually famine. In times of extreme hunger and malnourishment, Settlers might have sought other solutions, such as hunting and gathering, fishing, hunting seals and seabirds, using the seaweed to feed cattle. Sadly, this can only serve as increased pressure and exploitation of natural resources when you consider the number of people and livestock requiring sustenance. Chapter 4 of Eric's Saga tells us that at that time there was a season of great dearth in Greenland. Those who had been at the fishing had had poor hauls, and some had not returned. From archaeological evidence found in Greenland and accounts from the sagas, a Viking Age colony or society thrived there for a number of years, though the settlers did not completely evade the hardship felt by Iceland. Life in this Arctic region was unpredictable and at times difficult. The best chances of building a permanent community remained in the settlements on the coast of southern Greenland. The damage to grasslands caused by grazing herds continued to be an issue for the colonists. They also faced the same dilemma caused by the inability to harvest enough hay for fodder over the winter. The diets and eventually livelihoods of the Greenlanders were also supplemented with hunting and gathering, and this is something we will come back to in a moment. The saga of the Greenlanders gives us some indication of the conditions faced by Eric the Red and the colonists as they made their way to their new home. Of the 35 ships that set sail, only 14 arrived in Greenland safely. The rest were either driven back to Iceland or lost. Erik Sagarautha tells us about times of scarcity and suffering, as well as illness. What we know is that while Iceland remained a home to the settlers over generations, from the Viking Age to the present day, Greenland did not. It is estimated the last of the settlements were abandoned at some point in the 1400s. Theories for this include a steep decline in climate, collapse of the economy due to trade and proximity from Norway, and displacement by the native population. Recently data collected by biocultural and archaeological specialists on ancient settlement patterns and the surrounding landscape and diet suggests the Norse colony of Greenland relied more on the sea than pastoral farming. The topography of Greenland encouraged a shift from focusing on livestock to trade, especially in walrus ivory, and the data also reveals that food sources came mainly from the sea than the land. Environmental data indicates that the climate in Greenland significantly worsened during the period of Norse colonisation. It really does make for fascinating reading. Essentially, data recorded from oxygen isotopes and core samples taken from the Greenland ice sheet reveals temperature dropped by more than a degree over the five centuries of occupation. 
salt particles in the ice suggests an increase in storm activity, which would have been not only dangerous, but potentially crippling to walrus hunting expeditions. Bone fragments indicate that even the smaller farms kept livestock of some description, which implies the presence of essentially nutritious dairy products in the diet of a settler, while carbon isotopes and bone fragments also indicate a largely marine-based diet. Given the climate, conditions on land and at sea, and evidence collected in the present day, it is not hard to imagine another sequence of events that might propel a community to the brink of catastrophe. Facing a situation where starvation was a very real possibility, one must consider what an individual or community might think appropriate action in a society that fostered a strong sense of fate and honour and where paganism was still being practised. Eric Saga addresses this situation through an episode centering on a certain woman named Thorbjörg, nicknamed Little Prophetess, who goes around the Norse colony in Greenland telling people's fortunes. Chapter 4 in the saga relates a fascinating and much discussed visit by this woman to the farm where Gvudir and her family were staying after they arrived in Greenland. The extreme weather and privation people had endured that winter meant that they were on the brink of giving up. But Thorbjörg the prophetess is invited by the head of the household to his farm with the aim that she should tell these desperate people when the period of hardship will be over. Thorbjörg seems to be very old, both physically and culturally. And we gauge from the saga that heathen beliefs and rituals are on their way out to become a relic of the past. But old habits die hard, and once the prophetess arrives, we are given many details about the reverent welcome she is afforded, including being invited to sit in a high seat with a pillow filled with feathers, and she is given a meal of goat's milk porridge and offal stew. Thorbjörg's exotic outfit is intricately described, and she has various paraphernalia, including a staff with a copper alloy knob and gems, and catskin gloves, which associate her with Freya, who had a cart drawn by cats. When the time comes to perform the ceremony, the prophetess asks for help among the onlookers to summon the spirits, because they would only come if a special song was sung. We will get to Gwyrir's involvement in the ceremony in a minute. But let's take a closer look at what traditions might have been behind this literary representation of a pagan ritual, written by a Christian monk centuries after the conversion. Medicine, Magic and Runes Limb runes you must know if you want to be a healer, and know how to see to wounds. On bark they must be cut, and of the tree of the wood, on those whose branches bend east. The Lay of Sigtrifa The survival of folklore tales concerning healing, rituals, practices, and traditional treatments or remedies gives us a glimpse of how medicine and magic were once closely associated long ago. Collectors and archivists of such lore observe that at one time the healer's notion of illness was that it was of supranormal origin, caused either by preternatural beings, demons or devils, or a person with exceptional powers. It could be said that wise folk, so called for their skills, knowledge and abilities, had somewhat of an ambiguous position in a rural society, but the services of seers and healers were often highly valued. Having the ability to either harm or heal came with complications. The failure to provide help, unwanted foresight, or if accusations of malicious intent were made, could result in disastrous repercussions. It is difficult to gauge what the status of such people was in Norse pagan society, given that our sources to recover this are mostly sagas written several hundred years after the conversion to Christianity. But scholars have done remarkable work piecing together disparate written, runic and archaeological sources to reconstruct what Norse magic might have looked like in practice and social context. 
a curious piece of folklore thought to have originated from Norway, recounts how a healer's guidance was sought by parents whose young child had never uttered a sound. A series of rituals were advised, whereby the parents attempted to appease both the spirits of the land and their own sacred Christian beliefs. At one point, the child has passed through a hole in the ground with a turf lid. It has been suggested that this was in order to pacify the spirits of the earth and symbolically represented the child's rebirth. The fascinating folklore of the semi-nomadic Sami, a people indigenous to northern Scandinavia, Finland and northwestern Russia, reveals the concept of sickness spirits. These entities sometimes took the shape and appearance of their intended victim, or as a visual representation of disease, such as smallpox or plague. Folk tales collected by Emily de Hatt, an ethnographer who travelled with the nomadic reindeer tribes and recorded her encounters from 1907 until 1916, also reveals beliefs to counteract the intentions of said spirits that ultimately came from the everyday world the Sami inhabited. There is an intriguing connection between the Norse and the Sami, who are often regarded as possessing great ability as sorcerers. Though the two societies were geographically close to one another, their distinct cultures differed in many ways. Language, mythology and social history, for example. The role of the Jotnar in ancient Norse myth, and their relationship with the gods, undoubtedly prompts a consideration of whether these myths represent encounters between Norse and Sami groups. A paper by Elsa Mandal suggests that Skadi, a Jotun goddess associated with bow hunting, skiing, winter and mountains, who seeks revenge for her father Thiazi's death and marries Njorth, whom she mistakes for Balder, might have been modelled on a Sami woman. The Volva, like the Noede Sami shaman, and thought to assist in matters of healing and foresight, has also been described as a Jotun. In the mythological poem Voluspa, the god of wisdom, Odin, awakes a seeress from the dead, offering her tokens in order to gain her knowledge of events to come. The seeress begins to reveal the creation of the world, the gods and beings inhabiting it, and eventually Ragnarok, when the gods will do battle with their foes, among them the Jotnar. In the sayings of the High One, or Havamal, Odin, who is ever seeking knowledge, sacrifices himself so that he might learn the secrets of runes and spells. The section of the poem called Runatal, or Odin's Rune Song, concentrates on the origins of the runes, and the imagery contained in these verses is particularly striking. Runes formed the ancient Germanic alphabet before the adoption of the Latin alphabet. Variations include the elder and younger Futhark used in Scandinavia and the Anglo-Saxon Futhark. In Old English, rune means a secret or a mystery. In Old Norse, it means secret wisdom or writing. Runes were sometimes used to mark personal objects such as a bowl or a comb, or carved into markers recording the name of someone who had travelled to a certain place. And rune stones or memory stones in the Havamal, which were erected to honour the deceased, bearing inscriptions with their names and who sponsored the stone. Examples of the impressive memorials can be found across Scandinavia and Britain, but especially in Sweden, where stones such as the rock rune stone, containing around 760 characters, are located. The Icelandic sagas contain many scenes involving sorcery, spells and chants, used to either heal or harm an individual. In Ale Saga, our hero comes to the aid of Helga, a young woman who is suffering with a wasting sickness. Her family, in trying to find a way to heal her, are found to have mistakenly caused more harm than good, when a whalebone inscribed with runes is discovered to be at fault. After reading the runes, Ale shaved them off and scraped them into the fire. He burned the whalebone and had her bedclothes aired. No man should carve runes unless he can read them well. Many a man goes astray around those dark letters. On the whalebone, I saw ten secret letters carved. From them the linden tree took her long harm. 
The runes, ale carves and places beneath the pillow of the sickly young woman soon take effect and she swiftly begins her recovery. The Eddic poem Sigurdrifamal, spoken by the Valkyrie Sigurdrifa, gives us a list of runes to carve for different purposes, including healing, Limbrunir, and to help a woman in childbirth, Björgrunir, but also for good sailing weather, luck in battle, and to ward against poison and more. Written probably around 1400 by an unknown Icelandic scribe, Grettir Saga is a story of an outlaw who faces many a foe, be they alive, dead, human or otherwise. The character of Thurid, who is the foster mother of Grettir's nemesis, is said to have been skilled in the practice of magic when in her youth. When she is introduced into the tale, we are reminded that Iceland is now a Christian country. However, the law allowed for sacrificing and pagan rites to continue in private. A public display of such things resulted in lesser outlawry. At the behest of her foster son, Thurid performs a magic ritual that results in the death of Grettir. It is a remarkable scene. She took out her knife and carved runes upon the root, reddening the letters with her own blood as she chanted spells. Then she walked backwards around the trunk, moving to counter the sun's course while pronouncing powerful charms over it. Once Thurid completes her incantations, the tree trunk is cast into the sea as she utters the words and bring full harm to Grettir. Which it eventually does, when Grettir attempts to destroy the wood with his axe and mortally wounds himself in the process. While this is an example of magic being used for a malevolent purpose, the use of magic was not objectively evil, according to Norse sources, and it is rather represented as among several tools that were available to people. We even find episodes where a character is both helped and harmed by someone using magic on different occasions. General magic is a very widespread motif in the written sources, and even a text like Landnamabók, or the Book of Settlements, which is primarily concerned with recording who settled where, includes a story about a young man who is given a shirt by his mother. The garment makes him invulnerable, and when he gets into a fight with a neighbour, he is protected by the shirt. Interestingly, these people happen to be Gudir's maternal grandfather, Einar, and great-grandmother, Hildegunnur, who both lived at Laugabrekka, the farm where Gudir grew up. In Snorri Sturluson's Inglinka saga, a saga recounting the legendary history of Scandinavia, the goddess Freya is said to teach the other gods a taboo form of magic called Seilur, which can be used to reveal the future, but also harm others. While magic is a fairly common occurrence in sagas, the word seidr is not very widespread, and not all magic is seidr. But judging from the sources overall, the purpose of this particular form of magic seems consistent with this twofold description in Snorri. The most striking and extensive representation of seidr in all of the Norse sagas and poems is Eirik Saga's description of a ritual performed by the prophetess Thorbjörg. Once the seeress is satisfied with her welcome, she prepares the seidr ritual, asking for help to chant the verses necessary. At first, no one confesses to knowing these verses, but when it looks like the ceremony is going to be called off, Rudir admits that she learned the songs as a child from her foster mother Hattis. We can also recall that Rudir's great-grandmother was able to make magical garments and her grandfather Einar's grave mound was for mysterious reasons eternally green. So there may also be a predilection towards the supernatural in Gudir's line. But this aspect of her family history is only mentioned in the Book of Settlements, but not Eirik Saga or Grenlendika Saga. 
The latter two texts instead emphasize Guru's devoutness, but when she is staying in the home of someone who has graciously taken her family in, the question of religion becomes complicated. Although she is reluctant to engage in the ritual, Gurir gives in at the urging of her host, who after all is in a position to throw her out of the home, and she admits that she had learned a song called Vardlokur. Gurir sings the song so beautifully and competently that everyone is stunned by her talent. Consequently, the ceremony is a success. The spirits with which Thorbjörg communicates give good tidings about the future, and she conveys the news to the audience. The people recover their cheer, and soon after the weather improves and the period of hardship is over. During the ceremony, everyone was told their individual prophecy, and Gvurid received a particularly positive one. Thorberg tells her that from you will be descended a long and worthy line. Over all the branches of that family a bright ray will shine. Indeed, at the end of the saga, we get a bit of genealogical information. And it turns out that among Gwyrdi's descendants were no fewer than three bishops. One could surmise that the saga audience at the time of writing, including perhaps the descendants of Gwyrdi, had some anxieties about their forefathers' non-Christian beliefs. But while they could not completely cover up the past, the people who told Gwyrdi's story may have wanted to create a family history of exceptional Christian devotion going all the way back to the conversion era. The episode juxtaposes the heathen religion and the Christian one, but instead of pitting the two against each other, it expresses a recognition that the old beliefs are an undeniable part of history. The prophetess is no sinister witch or phony fortune teller. She's treated like a dignitary, and her expensive costume and refined behavior reinforce her respectability. However, she is old, and Gwurir is young. Although the two women part on friendly terms, the old woman represents a disappearing way of life, while Gwurir embodies the future. What does archaeology tell us? The description of Thorbjörg in Erik Sagarotha is significant when we consider particular objects archaeology has revealed in fascinating Viking Age burials. Items discovered with the remains of women could possibly indicate there is more to the story of the vulva. While grave goods may well give us clues as to the faith of those who have been buried and be seen as the possessions of the deceased, it is also possible they may have been gifts from loved ones or tokens of respect from mourners, or they may have been necessary items required by the deceased in the afterlife. However, there are burials where no grave goods are recovered at all. With this thought in mind, let us take a look at specific finds and burials. We shall begin with a grave that was uncovered near Hobro in Denmark, or the Ring Fortress of Birket. It is thought the fortress was established sometime around the year 980, during the reign of Harald Bluetooth. Excavations in the 1950s revealed evidence of oak posts and a turf embankment with a circumference of nearly 450 metres. Though the construction and subsequent recreation of the fortress is impressive, it was the discovery of a cemetery with a total of 30 graves in various states of preservation, that revealed something rather exciting. The grave of a woman, who may have been a seeress or a vulva. The woman was buried in the body of a horse-drawn carriage, and her clothing indicates she could have been of noble status. Fine blue and red cloth adorned with gold thread. There were grave goods that might be expected, such as scissors and spindle whorls. However, other items far more curious, such as silver rings on the woman's toes, a white lead belt buckle, and two bronze bowls from Central Asia. Still more curious was the partially disintegrated iron rod or wand with bronze fittings, a purse containing henbane seeds, a small box containing owl pellets and bird bones, and a small amulet shaped like a chair. 
the discovery of the seeds and the possible uses of henbane has drawn considerable attention. Also known as Hyosiamus niger, black henbane or stinking nightshade, the cultivation and use of this plant can be traced back to the ancient Greeks. Pedanius Dioscorides, author of De Materia Medica, a pharmacopoeia of medicinal plants, written between 50 and 70 CE, served as a physician in the Roman army and recommended the plant both for its sedative and pain-relieving qualities. Scholars, botanists and a variety of articles found in medical journals have explored the medicinal uses of henbane as an analgesic, antispasmodic and sedative. Due to the toxicity of the plant, it would have been essential to take great care in its preparation and application. Another burial of interest was found in Koppingsvik on the Swedish island of Åland, where runestone slabs have also been recovered. Grave goods accompanying a woman wrapped in a bearskin included a pitcher or jug from Central Asia, a bronze cauldron from Western Europe, and an iron staff. 82 centimetres in length, with bronze ornamentation, affixed to the top of the staff, a depiction of a house. The burial was found within a stone ship setting, whereby the grave is surrounded by stones or slabs in the shape of a boat or a ship, which was an early burial custom in Scandinavia. In Hage Beoga, Ostergotland in Sweden, a remarkable grave of a Viking Age woman was excavated by archaeologists. The woman had been laid to rest with a carriage, horses, Arabic bronze jugs and an iron wand or staff. However, the grave also contained a small piece of silver jewellery that appears to represent a woman adorned with a large necklace. It has been suggested the image might depict the goddess Freya and the necklace Brisingamen. The Osberg ship, found in 1904 outside Tosberg in Vestfold, is perhaps one of the most impressive and beautiful Viking Age burials discovered so far. The intricately carved vessel served as a tomb for two women, one who was approximately 50 years old, and the other around 70 to 80 years of age at the time of their deaths. The remains of the women reveal much, and yet we still have many questions unanswered. Who were they? Might they have been family? What was their social status within the community? Could they have been religious leaders? Was one sacrificed to accompany the other? The skeletal remains of the younger woman do not ascertain the cause of her death, though a broken collarbone suggests she suffered an injury in the weeks before dying. Her teeth had little signs of wear, which indicates she enjoyed a relatively good diet and had been regularly cleaned with a metal toothpick. The older woman tells us a different story. Her skeleton revealed she had suffered a serious illness during childhood, and her final years were most likely terribly painful. Signs of osteoporosis, two fused vertebrae in her neck, a lumbar fracture and knee injury, indicate she might have struggled to walk completely upright, and might also have suffered with a limp. Sadly, her final years were blighted with advanced cancer, which must have been incredibly unbearable. The Osberg ship is worthy of far more time and discussion, perhaps its own series of episodes, but for now we will concentrate on two artefacts that have led to suggestions they were intended for magical purposes. A small leather pouch containing cannabis seeds and a wooden pole or staff. Were these artefacts practical or ritual? Based on these items and others found in the ship, possible explanations are that the Osberg ship was a grave either for a high-status noblewoman or a religious volba. People must not worship heathen beings or practice witchcraft or put faith in special stones or animals. The Gragas the laws concerning magical stones, found in the Gragas, a collection of mandates from the Icelandic Commonwealth period, states that people are not to do things with stones or fill them with magic power 
with the idea of tying them to people or livestock. Further still, if a man puts trust in stones for his own health or that of his livestock, the penalty is lesser outlawry. What makes this interesting for us are the number of Viking Age burials in Iceland where pebbles or small stones are listed as grave goods. Several excavations describe the presence of these items in the graves of both women and men. Jasper, agate and quartz are also mentioned in varying quantities, sometimes only as fragments, and on one occasion, 58 small pieces of chalcedony were recovered with a female skeleton that had also been buried with 25 beads, a ring of copper alloy, iron tweezers and a piece of wax. What possible explanations might there be for such finds? Magical relics? Game pieces or counters? Semi-precious gemstones for decoration? Many graves contain jasper, which might well have been used as whetstone for sharpening knives and other implements. Though we cannot be certain of the reasons behind these artefacts being included in the graves of women and men from the Viking era, it is important to acknowledge that these items held some value or meaning, perhaps to the deceased, a family member, or mourner. The next chapter takes us in two directions geographically. On one hand, we learn about Eric the Red's son, Leivr, and his travels east to the Hebrides where he has an extramarital affair with Thorgunna, a high-born woman who also turns up in Eirvika saga. Leivr also goes to Norway, where he becomes the retainer of Olav Tryggvason, the missionary warrior king of Norway. Leivr agrees to evangelize the Christian faith in Greenland. But on his way there, his ship drifts off course, and he arrives in a mysterious land with self-sown wheat fields and grapevines, he quickly manages to get back to Greenland and many people convert to Christianity at his urging, including his mother Theolhildr, who had a church built, whereas his father clings on to the old gods and he's given the cold shoulder by his wife as a result. People don't just hear tidings of Christ, but also of this marvellous land to which Leivr had drifted and an expedition of 20 men sets off to try to find it again. They have no luck with the weather, and they come back in the autumn after futilely sailing around the Atlantic for weeks. But we sense that big events are on the horizon. Meanwhile, in Greenland, another son of Eric the Red, Thorstein, proposes marriage to Gudrilir, and this time Thorbjörn gives his consent. Apparently the son of a serial murderer, who is nevertheless descended from freeborn men of Norway, was more acceptable to him than Gudir's first suitor. Or perhaps Thorsten was a better man than his father. At any rate, the two of them get married and move to a place called Lysufjörður, or Ameralik in Greenlandic. This place was in the so-called Western Settlement, near present-day Nuuk whereas the saga's action had until now been in the eastern settlement, which was further south. In Lysefjörður, Gudrýður and Thorsteinn cohabit at a farm with another couple, a man also named Thorsteinn and his wife Sigríður. But hardship is a constant part of life in Greenland, judging from the saga, and it is not long before a pandemic breaks out among the Norse colonists, and most people fall ill though Gudrýður herself is spared. A major concern in the saga is that the dead be buried in a proper burial in consecrated ground. But there is also a more perplexing preoccupation with the inappropriate behaviour of corpses. As the disease ravages the community, Sigríður, the other woman, has a promontory vision where everyone who has died from the illness so far appears outside the farmhouse. But the group also includes Thorstein, Gudir's husband, who is still alive. Sigrid dies that night and her body is placed in a coffin. But the next day, Thorstein complains that the dead woman has been trying to get into his bed, 
Sigrid's husband is sent for to come and take care of his zombie wife, and her ghost is vanquished by driving an axe into her chest. It's not clear from the story whether Sigrid is supposed to be making sexual advances on Frostit. Illicit sexual attraction in households with more than one couple is sometimes a problem in the sagas. There could also be some other logic behind it, which is unclear to us modern readers. But soon Thorstedt sadly succumbs to the illness, joining the crowd of dead people that Sigrid had seen. But right after his death, he asks for Gudrir, and when she arrives at his bed, he whispers into his widow's ear that he wants to be buried in a consecrated cemetery. He also predicts her good fortune and encourages her to remarry both come true. Despite the immense challenges of trying to dig a grave in the Arctic tundra, the narrator reports that his body was transported to a church with a burial ground. The story about the couple's final exchange is included to reassure the audience that the Greenlanders did their utmost to follow the church's teachings and traditions, despite adverse conditions. The behavior of Sigridir is perhaps more unexpected but it expresses a fear of the dead not resting in peace, and perhaps especially lustfulness, which is visited upon the survivors. In her short life, Rudivir has survived her family becoming destitute, a terrible ocean journey across the North Atlantic, the loss of her foster parents and first husband, famine, a pandemic, and sundry violent and difficult personalities. The saga narrator does not do much in the way of explicitly reminding us about how immense these challenges were. And we have to keep in mind that despite the matter-of-fact style, living the Viking life must often have been anything but fun and exciting. In the next episode, we will hear about yet more dramatic events in the life of Gudrir and learn about how she remarried and joined another expedition to this mysterious land in the West. Another character who will feature prominently is Freytis, the daughter of Eric the Red, whose standoff with the natives in the West is one of the most memorable scenes in the sagas. If you enjoyed the material we covered in this episode, you can visit our website, www.vidfuerl.wordpress.com, to find more information. Listen to the previous episodes of the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. Or pick up a copy of Valkyrie, The Women of the Viking World. <laughs>
that he loaned Thorgest his bedstead boards. Eric afterwards went to Igni and dwelt at Eric's stad. He then demanded his bedstead boards back, but did not retrieve them. Eric then carried the bedstead boards away from Brida Bolstad, and Thorgest gave chase. They came to blows a short distance from the farm of the Rangar, where two of Thorgest's sons were killed, and several other men besides. After this, each of them retained a considerable body of men with him at his home. Styr gave Eric his support, as did Eyolf of Svini, Thorbjorn, Vifil's son, and the sons of Thorbrand of Altafjord, while Thorgest was backed by the sons of Hord the Yeller, and Thorgir of Hetherdal, Aslak of Langadal, and his son Elugi. Eric and his people were condemned to outlawry at Thor's nest thing. He equipped a ship for voyage in Eric's vag, while Eyjolf concealed him in the Munarvag when Thorgest and his people were searching for him among the islands. He said to them that it was his intention to go in search of that land which Gunbjorn, son of Ulf the Crow, saw, when he was driven out of his course westward across the main and discovered Gunbjorn's skerries. He told them he would return again to his friends if he should succeed in finding that land. Thorbjorn and Eyolf and Steer accompanied Eric out beyond the islands, and they parted with the greatest friendliness. Eric said to them he would render them similar aid, so far as it might lie within his power, if they should ever stand in need of his help. Eric sailed out to sea from Snaefell's Yokel Glacier, and arrived in Greenland, at that glacier which is called Black Cirque. From there he sailed to the south, so that he might ascertain whether there was habitable land in that direction. He passed the first winter at Eriksi, near the middle of the western settlement. In the following spring, he proceeded to Eriksfjord and selected a site there for his homestead. That summer, he explored the western uninhabited region, remaining there for a long time and assigning many local names there. The second winter he spent at Eric's home beyond Harfsnipa. But the third summer, he sailed northward to Snefell and into Hrafnsfjord. He believed then that he had reached the head of Eriksfjord. He turned back and remained the third winter at Eriksi, at the mouth of Eriksfjord. The following summer, he sailed to Iceland and landed in Bridafjord. He remained that winter with Ingolf at home later. In the spring, he and Thorgest fought together, and Eric was defeated. After this, a reconciliation was effected between them. That summer, Eric set out to colonise the land which he had discovered, and which he called Greenland, because, he said, men would be more readily persuaded there if the land had a good name. Chapter 3 Concerning Thorbjorn Thorgir Vifil's son took as his wife Arnora, daughter of Einar of Laugabrekka, Sigmund's son, son of Ketil Thistil, who settled at Thistil's fjord. Einar had another daughter named Halvag. She was married to Thorbjorn, Vifil's son, who got with her Laugabrekka land on Hellisfellir. Thorbjorn moved there and became a very distinguished man. He was an excellent farmer and had a prosperous estate. Gudrid was the name of Thorbjorn's daughter. She was the most beautiful of women, and in every respect an excellent woman. There lived at Arnarstapi a man named Orm, whose wife's name was Haldus. Orm was a good farmer, and a great friend of Thorbjorn, and Gudrid lived with him for a long time, as a foster daughter. There was a man named Thorgir, who lived at Thorgir's fell. He was very wealthy, and had been freed from enslavement. He had a son named Einar, who was a handsome, well-bred man, and very showy in his dress. Einar was engaged in trading voyages from one country to the other, and was quite successful. He spent his winters alternately either in Iceland or in Norway. It is said that one autumn, when Einar was in Iceland, he went with his goods out along Snæfellsnes, with the intention of selling them. He came to Arnarstapi, and Orm invited him to remain with him, and Einar accepted this invitation, for there was a strong friendship between them. 
Einar's wares were carried to a storehouse where he unpacked them and displayed them to Orm and the men of his household, and asked Orm to take such of them as he liked. Orm accepted this offer and said that Einar was a good merchant and was greatly favoured by fortune. Now, while they were occupied with the goods, a woman passed before the door of the storehouse. Einar inquired of Orm, Who was that handsome woman who passed before the door? I have never seen her here before. Orm replies, That is Gudrid, my foster child, the daughter of Thorbjorn of Laugodrekka. She must be a good match, said Einar. Has she had any suitors? Orm replies, Of course she has been courted, friend, nor is she easily to be won, for it is to be believed that both she and her father will be very particular in their choice of a husband. Be that as it may, said Einar, she is the woman to whom I mean to propose, and I would have you present this matter to her father on my behalf, and use every exertion to bring it to a favourable result and I shall reward you with the full of my friendship if I am successful. It may be that Thorbjorn will regard the connection as being to our mutual advantage, as while he is a most honourable man and has an excellent home. His personal situation, I am told, is somewhat worsening. On the other hand, neither I nor my father are lacking in lands or chattels, and Thorbjorn would be greatly supported if this match were brought about. I certainly believe myself to be your friend, replies Orm. But I am not at all keen to act in this matter, for Thorbjorn has an arrogant attitude and is moreover a most ambitious man. Einar replied that he wished for nothing else than his suit to be broached. Orm replied that he should have his will. Einar went again to the south until he reached his home. Some time after this, Thorbjorn had an autumn feast, as was his custom, for he was a man who lived in great style. Here came Orm of Arnarstathi and many other of Thorbjorn's friends. Orm came to speak with Thorbjorn and said that Einar of Thorgirsvel had visited him not long before and that he was becoming a very promising man. Orm now makes known the proposal of marriage on Einar's behalf and added that for some persons and for some reasons, it might be regarded as a very suitable match. It would be a substantial support to you in terms of your financial situation. Thorbjorn answers, Little did I expect to hear such words from you, that I should marry my daughter to the son of a slave. And since it seems to you that my means are diminishing, she shall not remain longer with you, considering that you deem such a low match suitable for her. Orm afterward returned to his home and all of the invited guests to their respective households, while Gudrid remained behind with her father and spent that winter at home. In the spring, Thorbjorn gave a party for his friends, attended by many, and it was a noble feast. At the banquet, Thorbjorn called for silence and spoke. Here have I lived a life of some length, and have experienced the goodwill of men toward me, and their affection and our relations together have been pleasant. But now I begin to find myself in straitened circumstances, although my estate has until now been considered a respectable one. Now will I rather abandon my farming than lose my honour, and rather leave the country than bring disgrace upon my family. For that reason, I have now concluded to put that promise to the test which my friend Eric the Red made when we parted company in Britiford. It is my present design to go to Greenland this summer, if matters fare as I wish. People were greatly astonished at this plan of Thorbjorn's, as he was blessed with many friends, but they were convinced that he was so firmly fixed in his purpose that it would not do to try to dissuade him from it. Thorbjorn gave gifts to his guests, after which the feast came to an end and everyone returned to their homes. Thorbjorn sells his land and buys a ship, which was laid up at the mouth of Traunhofen. Thirty people joined him in the voyage. Among these were Orm of Arnarstathi and his wife, and other of Thorbjorn's friends, who would not part from him. Then they put out to sea. When they sailed, the weather was favourable, but after they came out upon the open seas, the fair wind failed, 
and there came great gales and they lost their way. I had a very tedious voyage that summer. Then illness appeared among their people, and Orm and his wife Haldus died, and half of their company. The sea began to run high, and they had a very wearisome and wretched voyage in many ways, but arrived nevertheless at Heriofsness in Greenland during the winter nights. At Heriofsness lived a man named Thorkel. He was a man of ability and an excellent farmer. He received Thorbjorn and all of his ship's company, and housed them well during the winter. Chapter 4 At that time, there was a season of great dearth in Greenland. Those who had been at the fishing had had poor hauls, and some had not returned. There was a woman in the settlement whose name was Thorbjörg. She was a prophetess, and was called Little Sibyl. She had had nine sisters, all of whom were prophetesses, but she was the only one still alive. It was Thorbjörg's custom in the winters to go visiting from farm to farm, and she was especially sought after at the homes of those who were curious to know their fate, or what might be in store for them in the coming year. And inasmuch as Thorkel was the leading farmer in the neighbourhood, it was considered fitting for him to find out when the hard times which were upon them would cease. Thorkel invited the prophetess to his home, and careful preparations were made for her reception, according to the custom, which prevailed when women of her kind were to be received. A high seat was prepared for her, in which a cushion filled with poultry feathers was placed. When she came in the evening, with a man who had been sent out to meet her, she was dressed in a dark blue cloak, fastened with a strap, and set with stones all the way down to the hem. She wore glass beads around her neck, and upon her head, a black lambskin hood, lined with white cat skin. She carried a staff, upon which there was a knob ornamented with brass and set with stones. Circling her waist, she wore a charm belt, and attached to it a great skin pouch in which she kept the charms which she used when she was practising her sorcery. She wore upon her feet shaggy calfskin shoes with long, tough latchets, upon the ends of which there were large brass buttons. She had catskin gloves upon her hands, which were white inside and lined with fur. When she entered, all of the folk felt it to be their duty to offer becoming greetings. She responded to the salutations of each individual, according to how the person appealed to her. Farmer Thorkel took the sibyl by the hand and led her to the seat which had been made ready for her. Thorkel asked her to run her eyes over man and beast and home. She had little to say concerning all these. The tables were brought forth in the evening. It remains to be told what manner of food was prepared for the prophetess. A porridge of goat's milk was made for her, and for meat there was dressed the hearts of every kind of beast available there. She had a brass spoon and a knife, with a handle of walrus tusk with a double hasp of brass around the haft, and from this the point was broken. And when the tables were removed, Yeoman Thorkel approaches Thorbjörg and asks how pleased she is with the home and the character of the folk, and how speedily she would be likely to become aware of that concerning which he had questioned her, and which the people were anxious to know. She replied that she would not give an opinion in this matter before the morning. After that, she had slept there through the night. And late the next day, such preparations were made as were necessary to enable her to accomplish her soothsay. She asked them to bring her those women who knew the incantation which she required to work her spells and which she called ward songs. But such women were not to be found. Thereupon a search was made throughout the household to see whether anyone knew this incantation. Then says Gudrid, I am neither skilled in magic nor a prophetess, but my foster mother, Haldis, taught me in Iceland a chant that she called ward songs. Thorbjörg answered, Then you know more than I expected. Gudrid replies, 
This is an incantation and a ritual of such a kind that I do not mean to lend it any aid, as I am a Christian woman. Thorbjörg answers. It might be so that you could give your help to the company here. Still be no worse woman than before. However, I leave it with Thorkel to provide for my needs. Thorkel now urged Gudrid that she said she must comply with his wishes. The woman then made a ring about, while Thorbjörg sat up on the platform raised for the ritual. Gudrid then sang the song, so beautifully and well, that no one remembered ever before to have heard the melody sung with so fair a voice as this. The sorceress thanked her for the chant and said, She has indeed lured many spirits here, who think it pleasant to hear this song, those that were accustomed to turn away from us previously and refuse to submit themselves to us. Many things are now revealed to me, which hitherto have been hidden both from me and from others, and I am able to announce that this period of famine will last not longer, but the season will mend as the spring approaches. The outbreak of disease which has been plaguing you for long will disappear sooner than expected, and you, Gudrid, I shall reward out of hand for the assistance which you have secured for us, since the fate in store for you is now all made manifest to me. You shall make a most worthy match here in Greenland, but it shall not be of a long duration for you, for your future path leads out to Iceland, and a lineage both great and illustrious shall spring from you, and a bright ray of light shall shine above your line. And now farewell, my daughter. After this, the people went to the Sibyl, and each asked for information about those things which they were most curious to know. She was very ready in her responses, and little of what she predicted failed to come true. After this they came from a neighbouring farmstead to fetch her, and she departed. Thorbjorn was then sent for, since he had not been willing to remain at home while such heathen rites were being carried out. The weather improved speedily when the spring opened, even as Thorbjorn had prophesied. Thorbjorn equipped his ship and sailed away until he arrived at Bratalith. Eric received him with open arms and said it was well that he had come there. Thorbjorn and his household remained with him during the winter, while quarters were provided for the crew among the farmers. And the following spring, Eric gave Thorbjorn land on Stokanes, where a goodly farmstead was founded, and he lived there from then on. Chapter 5 Concerning Leif the Lucky and the Introduction of Christianity into Greenland. Eric was married to a woman named Thorhild and had two sons. One of these was named Thorstein and the other Leif. They were both promising men. Thorstein lived at home with his father and at that time there was no man in Greenland who was considered to have as much promise as he. Leif had sailed to Norway where he was at the court of King Olaf Tryggvason. When Leif sailed from Greenland in the summer, they were driven, of course, to the Hebrides. It was late before they got fair winds from there, and they remained there far into the summer. Leif fell in love with a woman whose name was Thorgunna. She was of good family, and Leif noted that she knew more than a little. When Leif was preparing for his departure, Thorgunna asked to go with him. Leif asked whether she had the approval of her kinsmen. She replied she did not care for it. Leif responded that he did not deem it wise to abduct so high-born a woman in a foreign country, and we so few in number. It is by no means certain that you will find this the better decision, said Thorgunna. I'll risk it all the same, said Leif. Then I tell you, said Thorgunna. But I am no longer a lone woman, for I am pregnant, and I declare it to be caused by you. I predict I will give birth to a boy in due course, and although you ignored this, I will raise the boy and send him to you in Greenland, when he is fit to travel with other men. And I predict that you, 
will get as much profit from this son as you deserve from our parting. Moreover, I mean to come to Greenland myself before the end comes. Leif gave her a gold finger ring, a Greenland mantle, and a belt of walrus tusk. This boy came to Greenland and was called Thorgils. Leif acknowledged his paternity. And some men will have it that Thorgils came to Iceland in the summer before the hauntings at Froda River. However, Thorgil stayed in Greenland after that, and there seemed to be something not altogether natural about him before it was all over. Leif and his companions sailed away from the Hebrides and arrived in Norway in the autumn. Leif went to the court of King Olaf Tryggvason. He was well received by the king, who felt that he could see Leif was a man of great accomplishments. On one occasion, the king spoke with Leif and asked him, Do you intend to sail to Greenland in the summer? That is my plan, said Leif, if it is your wish. I consider that a good plan, answers the king. And there you shall go on my errand, to proclaim Christianity in Greenland. Leif replied that the king should decide, but expressed his belief that it would be difficult to carry out this mission successfully in Greenland. The king replied that he knew of no man who would be better fitted for this undertaking. And you will have the good fortune that's needed. That will only be, said Leif, if I enjoy the grace of your protection. Leif put to sea when his ship was ready for the voyage. For a long time he was tossed about on the ocean and came upon lands of which he had previously had no knowledge. There were self-sown wheat fields and vines growing there. There were also those trees there, which are called maple, and they took specimens of all of them. Some of the timbers were so large that they were used in building. Leif found people upon a ship's wreck and took them home with him and procured quarters for them all during the winter. In this way, he showed his nobleness and goodness, since he introduced Christianity into the country and saved the people from the wreck, and he was called Leif the Lucky ever after. Leif landed in Eriksfjord and then went home to Bratalip. He was well received by everyone. He soon proclaimed Christianity throughout the land and the Catholic faith and announced King Olaf Tryggvason's messages to the people, telling them how excellent and glorious this faith was. Eric was slow in forming the determination to forsake his old belief, but Fjordhild was quick to embrace the faith and had a church built at some distance from the house. This building was called Fjordhild's Church, and there she and those persons who had accepted Christianity, and there were many, offered their prayers. Fjordhild would not sleep with Eric after her conversion, much to his displeasure. At this time, there began to be much talk about a voyage of exploration to the country Leif had discovered. The leader of this expedition was Thorstein Eriksson, who was a good man and intelligent and blessed with many friends. Eric was likewise invited to join them, for the men believed that his luck and foresight would be of great help. He was slow in deciding, but did not refuse when his friends asked him to go. Next, they equipped the ship in which Thorbjorn had come out, and twenty men were selected for the expedition. They took little cargo with them, nothing save their weapons and provisions. On the morning when Eric set out from his home, he took with him a little chest containing gold and silver. He hid this treasure, and then went his way. He had proceeded only a short distance, however, when he fell from his horse and broke his ribs and dislocated his shoulder and cried, I, I. Because of this accident, he sent his wife word that she should retrieve the treasure which he had concealed, because he attributed his misfortune to the hiding of the treasure. After that, they sailed cheerily out of Eriksfjord in high spirits, and they were excited about their plan. They were long tossed about upon the ocean and could not follow the course they wished. They came in sight of Iceland, and likewise saw birds from the Irish coast. 
Their ship was driven here and there over the sea, and in the autumn they turned back, worn out by toil and exposure to the elements and exhausted by their labours, and arrived at Eriksfjord at the beginning of winter. Then said Eric, More cheerful we were in the summer when we put out of the fjord, but we are still alive, and it could have been much worse. Thorstein answers, It would be a generous act to look after all these men who are now in need, and to make provision for them during the winter. Eric answers, It is ever true, as is said, that it is never clear before the answer comes, and so it must be here. We will act now upon your counsel in this matter. All of the men, who were not otherwise provided for, accompanied the father and son. They landed thereupon and went home to Bratelud, where they remained throughout the winter. Chapter 6 Thorstein Eriksson Weds Gudrud Apparitions Now it is to be told that Thorstein Eriksson sought the hand of Gudrid, Thorbjorn's daughter, in marriage. His suit was favourably received both by herself and by her father, and it was decided that Thorstein should marry Gudrid, and the wedding was held at Bratelud in the autumn. The feast was a success and very well attended. Thorstein had a home in the western settlement, at a farmstead called Lysufjord. Half of this property belonged to a man named Thorstein, whose wife's name was Sigrid. Thorstein went to Lysufjord in the autumn, to his namesake, and Gudrid went with him. They were well received and remained there during the winter. It came to pass that a sickness appeared in their home early in the winter. Gardi was the name of the overseer there. He had few friends. He fell sick first and died. It was not long before one after another took sick and died. Then Thorstein, Eric's son, fell sick, and Sigrid, the wife of Thorstein, his namesake. And one evening, Sigrid wished to go to the outhouse, which stood opposite the door of the farmhouse, and Gudrid accompanied her. They were facing the outer door when Sigrid uttered a loud cry. We have acted carelessly, exclaimed Gudrid, but though you were cold, you need not cry. Let us go in again as quickly as we can. Sigrid answers, I will not go in as things stand now. All of the dead folk are standing here in front of the door now. Among them I see your husband Thorstein, and I can see myself there. And it is terrible to look upon. When this had passed, she exclaimed, Let us go now, Gudrid, I can no longer see them. The overseer had vanished from her sight, whereas it had seemed to her before that he stood with a whip in his hand, ready to whip the people. So they went in, and before the morning came she was dead, and a coffin was made for her body. That same day, the men planned to row out to fish, and Thorstein accompanied them to the landing place, and at dusk he went down to check on their catch. Thorstein, Eric's son, then sent word to his namesake that he should come to him, saying that all was not as it should be there, for the housewife was seeking to rise to her feet, and wished to get in under the clothes beside him, and when he entered the room, she was come up on the edge of the bed. Then he seized her hands and held a poleaxe before her breast. Thorstein Eriksson died before nightfall. Thorstein asked Gudrid to lie down and sleep, saying that he would keep watch over the bodies during the night. She did so. Gudrid fell asleep, and early in the night, Thorstein Eriksson sat up and spoke, saying that he wished Gudrid to be summoned, for he wanted to speak with her. It is God's will that this hour be given to me to improve my condition. Thorstein the master went in search of Gudrid and woke her, and asked her to cross herself and pray God to help her. Thorstein Eriksson has said to me that he wishes to see you. You must decide what to do, or I have no advice to give you. She replies, It may be 
that this is intended to be one of those incidents which shall afterward be held in remembrance. A strange event. And it is my trust that God will keep watch over me. With God's mercy, I will risk going to him and learning what it is that he wants to say, since I won't escape this if it is designed to bring me harm. I'd rather he not go any further, and I suspect that would be the alternative. So Gudrid went and approached Thorstein, and he seemed to her to be weeping. He spoke a few words in her ear in a low tone, so that she alone could hear them. But this he said so that all could hear, that those persons would be blessed who kept the faith, and that it brought help and mercy. Yet there were many, he said, who kept it poorly. It is no good practice which has been observed here in Greenland since Christianity was introduced here, to bury people in unconsecrated earth with barely any funeral service. I wish to be taken to the church, together with the others who have died here. Guard day, however. I would have you burn upon a pyre as speedily as possible, since he has been the cause of all the hauntings which have occurred here this winter. He spoke to her also of her own destiny, and said that she had a remarkable future in store for her, but asked her to beware of marrying any Greenlander, he directed her also to give their property to the church and to the poor, then sank down again a second time. It had been the custom in Greenland, after Christianity was introduced there, to bury persons on the farmsteads where they died in unconsecrated earth. A pole was erected in the ground, touching the breast of the dead, and subsequently, when the priests came there, the pole was withdrawn and holy water poured in the hole, and the funeral service was held there, although it might be much later. Bodies of the dead were taken to the church at Eriksfjord, and funeral services were held there by the clergy. Thorbjorn died soon after this, and all of his property then passed to Gudrid. Eric took her to his home, and carefully looked after her affairs. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you have enjoyed the beginning of Gudrid's story and her intriguing encounter with Thorbjörg, the little prophetess. Please feel free to get in touch and visit us on vidbro.wordpress.com where you can find links and texts allowing you to follow the Vinland sagas and research these fascinating women. And also the folktale Gulbra Ogsgege i Hvavi, which Johanna has very kindly translated for us. The video release for episode 2 will be with you shortly, but in the meantime, we have some wonderful people to thank. The band Siao and Bellum Prado kindly gave us permission to use their marvellous music, and we were delighted to share it with you. The Hands on History team allowed us to use the amazing photographs of their work, our videos just wouldn't be the same without these images. And our portraits of the Finland women have been provided by the exceptional artist Tiffany Kendra Clark. Links to these fantastic contributors will of course be in the show description. Take care for now, and join us again soon for more tales of women from the Vinland sagas.